BIU Online presents GEC 101 English Composition, Week 4, Practical Lecture, Effective Language and Sentence Grammar. This lecture is presented by Dr. Laura Hills, Professor of English at Virginia International University. Expanding your vocabulary can expand your ability to reach a wide variety of audiences. But how can you expand your vocabulary practically? You may have heard this before, but people who read frequently are better writers, and part of what they're better at is their vocabulary. Even though you don't have definitions necessarily built into the text you're reading, the context will help you figure out meanings and you will begin to increase your vocabulary without having to do any explicit work on that one thing. So a very good idea is to read more. Also, to purchase and use different kinds of dictionaries depending upon your interests and needs. There are abridged dictionaries, both in print and online. Unabridged dictionaries are those that include whole lots of information. And OED stands for the, the one everyone points to. That's the Oxford English Dictionary, which is a huge, huge work. But what I'd like to talk about are the specialized dictionaries. And you can find these in different fields and in, with different kinds of information. And I've listed some here. A dictionary of usage, synonyms, idioms, slang, or discipline-specific dictionaries. A good example is that many of our English language students at Virginia International University are not familiar with American idioms. So they might pick up a dictionary to help them make sense of them. Uh, one book I remember using and teaching some English as a second language courses was one on common American phrases. As for discipline specific, when I was working on my master's degree in English and focusing on literature, I remember I purchased and used a dictionary of literary theories. There are so many of them. And it was extremely helpful to me as an accompaniment to my coursework. So if you are in a discipline or looking for certain types of information, see if there is a dictionary that you can use as a resource. One of the ways that I teach vocabulary is to teach root words. Because if you learn roots of words, you're able then to figure out many more words. It's a very efficient way to increase your vocabulary. So here's a little example of that. If you learn, for instance, that auto means self when it's the root of a word, or bio means life, or that graph means to write, it opens up all kinds of words that you can figure out without having to look up the definition. For instance, what would an auto biography B or autobiography. It would be writing about one's own life, combining all three of those. But you also can figure out what an autograph is. It's writing one's own, the self's name, or what a bio biography is. It would be writing about someone's life. So this is a very efficient way, rather than memorizing individual words, to study roots and their meanings. Also studying prefixes of negation or opposition. And I've given you a number here when you see a, contra, dis, ill, mal, non, or un at the beginning of a word. It means the opposite of or the negative of. So amoral means not moral. To contradict is to speak against. Something that's distasteful is not tasteful. Illegal, not legal. Malpractice means the wrong practice. Nonsense, not making sense, and unable means not able. You can see that knowing these, when you see contra, if you know it means against or the opposite, you know a whole bunch of words. 
because you can figure out anything that begins with that, you know it's the opposite of what follows. There are also prefixes of quantity, and it will help you to know that bi means two, mono means one, semi means half, tri means three, and omni means all. So if you have a bicycle, it's two wheels. A tricycle is three wheels. A milligram is one thousandth of a gram. A monocle, mono, is one. It's one lens. Omniscient means all-knowing. A semicircle, a half circle. And unitary means undivided, whole, one. So knowing just those few little parts of words helps you figure out so many more. There are also prefixes of space and of time. Anti with an E is a prefix that means coming before. Circum means around. And then we have micro, post, sub, super, and trans. So let's look how this would work. Antebellum is a period before the bellum. And we actually, in the United States, use this term to mean before the United States Civil War, which happened in the 1800s. If you circumnavigate something, it means you circle around it. You navigate around it. A microscope, a device for seeing tiny things. Post-war, after the war. Submarine, underwater or beneath water. Boat. Superhuman, above human. Trans means across. It means to carry across. You can also look at suffixes, those parts at the ends of words. If we know that ology means the study of something, then what do these words mean? Biology. We just learned bio means life, ology means study of. Therefore, it is the study of life. Criminology, the study of crime and criminals. Anthropo means man, so anthropology, the study of man. Phonology. Phono is a sound or hearing, it's actually in linguistics the sound of human language. So we have the study of that. Epidemiology, the study of epidemics. Geo Earth, the study of Earth, geology. Paleo means dinosaur era, prehistoric. Paleontology, the study of dinosaurs. Eco, ecology, the study of life in the world. Astrology is the stars and how they work. Derma means skin. The study of dermatology is study of skin. Genealogy is the study of lineage. Methodology is the study of methods. And in doctoral dissertation work, you would have to know about the methodologies available to you. Ornithology, study of birds. And psych or mind, psychology is the study of the mind. You see how easy it is to figure that out once you know ology. How about these made-up words? Ready? Try this one on for size. What would a dogology be? That's right, the study of dogs. I made these words up. Californiology, the study of California. Hamburgerology, the study of hamburgers. Handbagology, the study of handbags. Skateboardology, the study of skateboards. Pickleology, the study of pickles. Internetology, the study of the internet. Cell phoneology, the study of cell phones. And cheesecakeology, the study of cheesecake. Now, granted, I've made these up, but you see how you could figure each of them out. And finally, basketballology the study of the American sport basketball. Suffixes, let's go a little further. If we know that esq, E-S-Q-U-E, -E, at the end of a word means reminiscent of, what do these words mean? If something is described as picturesque, it means it's reminiscent or reminding one of a picture. As for your statuesque, it's rem reminiscent of a statue. Japanesque, reminiscent of objects or culture of Japan. Romanesque, the study of the reminiscent of something from Rome. Sculpturesque, something that's reminiscent of a sculpture. Arabesque is a most interesting word. It's a dance term for a particular posture in dance. And it's supposed to be reminiscent of, of someone from, I suppose, who's of an Arabian background. 
Now let's make up some on the right side. Zombie-esque, reminiscent of a zombie. Supermodel-esque would be reminiscent of a supermodel. Kafka-esque and Lincoln-esque and Obama-esque are actually forms you will find. It means reminiscent of a famous person, in this case Franz Kafka, the author, Abraham Lincoln, and, and of course Barack Obama, both Lincoln and Obama being American presidents. And what would VIU-esque mean? It would mean something reminiscent of VIU. So you may see esque at the end of all kinds of words. Authors often do include them at the end of a name like Lincoln or Kafka to say that something that they're talking about is reminiscent or reminding of the source that they're speaking of. More on suffixes. If we know that less means without, what do these words mean? And I think that's pretty pretty transparent. Senseless, seamless, childless, rimless, motionless, without all of those things. Painless, without pain, endless, horseless. We used to say in the United States when cars were first invented, automobiles, they were horseless carriages. Lawless, without law, nameless, peerless, matchless, rudderless, shoeless, and spotless. Very easy to figure out what those mean. And contrary to less is full. If full means having a great quantity of, what do these words mean? Hopeful, full of hope, fanciful, insightful, unfruitful, vengeful, beautiful, beauty, fearful, earful, ungrateful, youthful, grateful, faithful, masterful, unhelpful, boastful, artful, dreadful, thankful, useful, forceful. These are real words. And so, we know it means full of whatever precedes it. Now, we've just explained some ways that you can increase your vocabulary by learning about the roots, prefixes, and suffixes. But what are some other practical ways to increase your vocabulary? Well, many people find it helpful to keep a list of the new words that they encounter, either through listening or reading. And if you want to increase your vocabulary and this is your priority, it would be a wonderful exercise. Keeping a list of new words. Another thing you can do is to work on opposites, to see how words relate to one another. So these are some examples. If someone is overwhelmed, the opposite could be powerful. I purposely chose word pairs that were not that obvious. We have to figure out what an opposite would be for generous might be stingy or cheap. Someone who's courteous, the opposite could be that there is someone who's impolite. Exhausted and energetic, orphaned, parented, busy, idle, visceral, and logical. It's a good way to think about how words relate to one another. As you read, Try to come up with better words than the author used. Now, some of you may already have done a great deal of writing in your life, and some of you are going into hyperdrive for the first time in GEC 101 and maybe writing more than you have before. I can tell you as a professional writer who has been at it for more than 30 years that one of the liabilities of writing a lot is that you become a much more critical reader. And I find that I often am reading something and editing, editing it in my own mind. I think that there were better ways the author could have expressed the same thought. And that's not an entirely bad thing. If you're able to see that the author maybe could have said things more concisely, more elegantly, or had used a better word, that's one way to increase your vocabulary, to exercise that skill. An important thing about new words is that if you just write them down, I'm, I'm not so sure that you're going to have much of a change in your vocabulary. But when you use the word, when you write and you speak, that's when you begin to own it and make it part of your knowledge base. So make a conscious effort to use the new words that you learn. Words work best for you when they are spelled correctly. We all know that, right? But what does that mean practically? Well, these days we all have spell checkers. And I love spell checkers because they can catch a lot of 
typographical errors that I'm likely to make in my writing. But if you rely on them too heavily, you're going to end up with some interesting mistakes. For example, take a look at this. See what I mean? That is see what I mean. Those are all words. They are actual words that a spell checker would not flag as incorrect. But it, of course, makes no sense. I'm trying to say see what I mean spelled totally differently. So if I relied on my spell checker, I would be in deep trouble here. It wouldn't catch any of those errors. So it's a great tool, but over-reliance on it will lead to unfortunate errors like this one. Here's a tip. When it's really important, like the cover letter for a job application or your resume. Proofread forward and backwards. So instead of reading I think, therefore I am, in the second read through go am I, therefore think I. It's amazing. You will find when you're not reading for content but for spelling, going backwards forces you to see errors that you sometimes will miss when you read it in the conventional way. Understanding grammatical structures can help you produce sentences that are appropriate, effective, and grammatically correct. True. But what does that mean practically? Well, you're not someone who just landed on Earth never having studied grammar before. You've studied grammar for quite a long time, long before we met in GEC 101. And yet, my guess is that if you're like most students, you're going to continue to make some grammatical errors. That's an interesting question. Why, if you've studied it before and you know rules, you haven't mastered them to the point where you use them correctly in your writing. So what I find working with students, the best technique is to work on improving one thing at a time. If you have many grammatical errors in your work and you try simultaneously to work on subject verb agreement and pronoun and antecedents and all of the other things that you may be doing that are mistakes, it's not going to work for you as well as if you work on improving one thing at a time and getting that thing right. So work on the problem that will give you the biggest payoff. In other words, something that you do maybe frequently or that confuses the reader. Make that your one goal in your writing for now. If your instructor identifies a problem with your grammar, be sure you really do understand it and read about it and ask and ask and ask until you know why you have to do things differently. If you just have something corrected and you don't know why, there's no hope of you ever correcting it yourself. You need to understand the rationale. Proofread with your single grammar goal in mind and be sure you get that one thing right. Remember, we're focusing on the one thing with the biggest payoff. So after you write, go back over and say, okay, I have trouble with subject verb agreement. Let me check every sentence for that one thing. Then, when you've mastered that challenge, go on to the next one. This I have found to be a much more effective way to help students improve their grammar than to tell them 12 things to do at the same time. Do them sequentially, starting with the one that's going to have the biggest payoff in making your writing better. Here's a tip, once again, Readers generally not only have better vocabulary, as we mentioned earlier in this lecture, but they have better grammar because they're exposed to good models of the grammar. And it starts to feel right to them and sound right to them. So once again, the advice is spend more time reading. This concludes the practical lecture for week four.